As I sat pondering the recent events, I couldn't identify any specific signs indicating she was being unfaithful, no matter how hard I tried. The unease I felt stemmed from numerous small details accumulating rather than one glaring issue. There was definitely something going on, yet I couldn't grasp what it was. I was certain of some mischief, but lacked evidence. I was clueless about who, what, or where this was happening, to the point where I questioned my own sanity. Am I reading too much into this situation? Perhaps I'm exaggerating, conjuring various scenarios of her infidelity, but with whom? I couldn't say, yet my gut churned with uncertainty. I sensed, rather than knew, that something was amiss. Perhaps this marked the onset of an affair, possibly a one-time occurrence. The more I dwelled on thoughts and fantasies, the more self-assured I felt. It seemed like I'd been in this mental space for weeks, but how long had it been before I even slightly sensed something was amiss? I took another sip of my JD. The clinking ice signaled a need for a refill. Catching the bartender's eye, he nodded and smoothly exchanged my glass for another double JD on the rocks. He offered a faint smile, seemingly understanding my inner turmoil. He had encountered that expression countless times. His gaze conveyed both support and empathy as he noticed the distress in my eyes. The sweet taste of JD warmed my mouth and throat with each sip. I resolved to calm myself, scanning the bar and observing a few other patrons. It was serene, the murmurs of conversation filling the air with incomprehensible words, amplifying my growing sense of discontent. There was no happiness here. The patrons' faces were devoid of emotion, blending into the crowd without distinction. Everyone seemed plain and unremarkable. The lone woman, appearing to be in her forties and slightly overdressed for the time and place, perhaps appeared a bit desperate, was being treated to drinks by an older man who seemed hopeful and attentive towards her. He didn't need to try so hard. I figured she already had his number. The other patrons appeared to be simply passing time while the rain outside further dampened the mood, and soon they would each run out of reasons to linger in the comfort of the bar and head home. I still haven't made up my mind about what I'm going to do. So, what's going on? I turned toward the voice. She gazed at me, her eyes peering deep into my soul. Though I thought I opened my mouth to respond, no words came out. She stood in the dimly lit bar, water dripping from her coat as she began to remove it. What brings you here, Sammy? I was worried about you and had a hunch I'd find you here. So, here I am. Do you want to talk? I looked at her, trying to regain some composure. Are you concerned about me? Why? What's happening? I scrutinized her, wondering if she had any hidden motives. Could I trust her? I took a sip of my JD and ordered her a drink and soda, which the bartender served with flair. Smiling at the sight of Sammy, she caught his eye as he served her, flashing one of his charming smiles as his gaze lingered on her ample bosom accentuated by her tight blouse. Sammy waited until the bartender walked away before addressing the situation. There was a mutual sense of uncertainty between us, along with an unspoken power struggle. I mentioned concerns about her recent behavior, indicating that she appeared burdened. I expressed a desire for her to share what was going on. When I looked into her brown eyes, I was reminded of how effortlessly she understood me, like an open book. This understanding between us was something I deeply valued. Despite occasional disagreements, we maintained a transparent and honest relationship. However, there were certain things we didn't explicitly discuss, yet we both understood them. She reassured me, saying she was fine, and that our relationship was in a good place, alleviating my worries. I watched as she processed my words. It was clear she wasn't buying it. My heart sank, and I tried to shake off the feeling, but it lingered. Sammy took a deliberate sip from her glass, her gaze penetrating into mine once more. Oh, God. This is it, I thought. She set her glass down and interlocked her fingers, leaning slightly forward toward me. I tried to play it cool by asking what she knew and what I was supposedly hiding. She responded by suggesting we drop the act and be genuine with each other. This caught the attention of the bartender, who subtly turned his head to listen in. She then proposed we find a more private booth, as the current setting was too public. As we moved to a secluded booth, I could see disappointment on the bartender's face. Once seated across from each other, the tension was palpable as we prepared for our forthcoming conversation. I mentioned that I had competed in a tournament and asked for her opinion. She saw through my attempt at deception and reminded me that we had known each other for a long time. She urged me to confide in her, mentioning her familiarity with Sammy since she was 17. 
She noted that Sammy had always been around and had once had a crush on her when she dated Sammy's sister, Claire. Claire was three years older and we began dating when we were both 20. Sammy and I always got along, much to the displeasure of her older sister. They were as different as night and day in many ways, but their personalities clashed often, evidenced by the numerous quarrels between the sisters over the years. Two years later, Claire and I tied the knot and envisioned what I believed to be an ideal future. We both held respectable jobs and earned enough to lead a comfortable life. My sister-in-law, Sammy, had her share of fun in her late teens and early 20s, and now, at 25, was seeking something more mature. I felt like she had outgrown her wild phase and had become someone any man would be fortunate to know. Claire and I have been married for five years. Well, we'll reach five in a month when our anniversary arrives. That's if we make it that far, I thought. Sammy is a very attractive woman, and someone I considered a friend as well as my sister-in-law. Tears welled in my eyes as I gazed at her, searching for words to express how I felt. But still, her words, I know, resounded loud and clear in my mind. She reached across the table, her fingers caressing mine before squeezing them tightly, a gesture of support, and more, as I felt my heart slowly shattering. All right, Steve, if you won't tell me, then I'll say it. She's cheating on you. I'm pretty sure you know this. Of course I know. What are you going to do about it now? My eyes widened at those words, yet I still resisted understanding as I stubbornly tried to rationalize what I knew and what it meant. I didn't want to hear anything anymore. In my mind, if I didn't truly know, then it couldn't have happened. And thus, it couldn't have hurt me. I wouldn't have to deal with it either. Sammy gazed at me, noticing the distant look in my eyes. Was it shock or denial? Steve... I love you dearly, but for goodness sake, wake up. I'm sure it's some kind of misunderstanding or something. I attempted to brush it off and deceive myself further. Suddenly, Sammy's eyes flashed with anger. She reached out and slapped me hard across the face. The bartender halted, wiping the glass he held. Everything all right over there? I raised my hand. Yes, everything's fine here. I touched my cheek, feeling the heat from the slap and certain Sammy's perfect handprint lingered there. I'm sorry, Steve, but sometimes you drive me crazy. You know how much I care about you, and I can't bear to see you hurt like this. So be wise and courageous. This is happening, and we need to address it. I swallowed, rubbing my cheek, as the seriousness of my situation sank in, the pain from her slap jolting me to reality. All right, I'll start. I'm sure you at least suspect something, but I'll continue anyway. A few weeks back, I was with her when her cell phone rang. She stepped out to answer it, which struck me as odd, considering we're sisters, darn it. What could she be hiding from me? I nodded, bracing myself for the worst. But as I sipped my JD, she continued. I just found it peculiar. So when I had the chance, I checked her phone. She's so trusting. There wasn't even a lock code on it. The call was from a guy in her contacts who introduced himself as Robert. I had no clue about any Robert or Bob, but I decided to keep an eye out for any recurrence. So who's this guy, Robert or Bob? I inquired, trying to recall any mention of this name. I actually found out about him roughly a week later. He's someone she knew years ago, before she even started dating you. Anyway, it seems he reached out to us through some social network or chat site. Looks like they've been messaging each other for a while now. But I had no idea. All I sensed was that there were these little things happening that seemed to fly under the radar. Yeah, I get it. But it all seemed to fit into their interactions. Nothing overt, but it felt like everything was aligning for them. So it's just two friends messaging each other, reminiscing about the old days or something? It seems that way. That's how it began, anyhow. Are you implying something happened? Yes. And you're saying you didn't detect anything suspicious? Just that it felt like circumstances were working against us. Plus, the glaring absence of opportunities for fun. Sammy regarded me with an incredulous expression, as if I were being foolish. What? I returned her gaze. Steve, I care about you deeply, but come on, snap out of it. Reality sank deeper into my foggy mind as her words grew increasingly real. Damn, I thought this was serious. Taking another sip, I mustered my courage. How far do you think it went? Or do you know? Sammy met my gaze. Her eyes gleamed, briefly averting before locking back onto mine. That fleeting glance told me everything I needed to know. When? How? Where? I queried hastily. My mind raced to catch up as anger began to simmer within me. The battle between reason, sensibility, and raw fury had commenced. I know she's seen him at least three times in the past two weeks. Initially, I wasn't certain, 
and it was only two days ago that I confirmed it had escalated. I was having lunch with a friend who works alongside Claire, and she accidentally let it slip. I didn't react then, and Claire hit it well, so I let it slide. Turns out she met him twice for lunch and at least once for dinner last week. Does this align with what you observed? I studied her, absorbing her revelations. There have been a couple of instances recently where I phoned her office to arrange a lunch meeting, but she wasn't there. Or she had just left. Was that when she met him? Then? Last week she attended a seminar that she insisted on going to. It was announced last minute and scheduled for after work that evening. She returned home late, past midnight, reminiscing about the event. She mentioned it had dragged on, and her team went for a drink at the hotel bar before leaving. I also recall there was no closeness that night, and she took a shower before bed. My thoughts raced. My mind swirled in confusion as I absorbed these painful truths, each one intensifying the agony and twisting the knife lodged firmly in my heart. To hell with all this, I suddenly spat. Sammy glanced at me, her eyes now reflecting concern. Steve, what's your plan? Don't do anything reckless. You don't want to end up in legal trouble because of her. Meeting her gaze, I sensed she had detected the shift in me. My face felt like stone, my heart a solid block of granite. My body braced for what lay ahead and she could see it. To hell with all this. I refuse to tolerate this under any circumstances. It ends now. She'll pay. He'll pay too. Rage bubbled within me. My muscles tightened. Fists clenched. I've never been one for violence. Sure, I've had my fair share of confrontations in my younger days, but I never sought out trouble. Sometimes you simply must confront the truth, which is precisely what I intended to do. It had been a while, but it needed addressing and fast. Steve, whatever you're thinking, take a moment. Consider your options. Don't act hastily without a plan. Otherwise, things will spiral out of control. You need to strategize and prepare. Otherwise, you'll only end up getting hurt, she cautioned. Her words tempered my rage, penetrating the rational part of my brain and making sense. Strangely enough, it helped me to regain some composure, realizing that my suspicions were indeed valid. At least I wasn't losing my mind. Is she there right now? I glanced at Sammy, noticing tears welling up in her eyes as a solitary tear traced down her delicate face. Yes, she's with him at this moment. That's why I sought you out she revealed. Rage surged within me, prompting me to pound my fist on the table. Heads turned in the bar, drawing attention. I signaled to the bartender, who responded with a knowing half-smile. How did he know? Do you have any idea where exactly? I inquired, hopeful for some clarity. No clue, but tomorrow I'll meet with my friend again to gather more information. I know he's married with kids, but I'm unsure of his exact whereabouts. I'll do my best to find out. It might help, she responded. I reached for her hand, gripping it tightly and wiped a tear from her cheek. Thanks, Sammy. I know this is tough for you, but I truly appreciate it. What's your plan? She regarded me with concern. I can't act impulsively, not yet anyway. But I'll put an end to it. When I do, it'll be final with no regrets. They'll both face consequences. For now, I'll safeguard what's mine and gather evidence for my next move. Sammy eyed me anxiously as I finished my JD. Catching the bartender's eye, he poured us another round. As he approached, I sensed Sammy wanting to speak. I motioned to wait until the drinks arrived, then handed the bartender a bill. Keep the change, I said, dismissing him. How long before you confront her? I pondered. I need time to strategize. Tomorrow I'll make some calls and secure my assets. She won't get a cent from me if I have my way. It'll be tough for you to be around her, won't it? Yes, I realize that. But in a way, it's been that way for weeks now. If she hasn't noticed a change yet, she won't notice anything different. Sammy downed her drink in one gulp and rose abruptly. I have to go, Steve. Can we chat again tomorrow? I'll gather all the info I can. She donned her coat and I stood, assisting her, sensing her proximity. Darn. She resembled her sister so much. Tears welled in her eyes as I kissed her cheek. Head home. I'll manage. I'll ring you up tomorrow. With a smile, she turned away, and I watched her depart into the dark, damp evening. Taking a deep breath, I settled back into my seat pondering my next move. One thing was clear. They would face consequences, swift, ruthless, and unforgiving. Memories faded after that. Somehow I awoke in my own bed, mouth dry as a desert. My head still spun as I lifted myself from the bed. Rolling over, I noticed I was alone, with Claire nowhere in sight. My senses gradually returned as I heard a noise downstairs. I swung my legs off the bed and attempted to rise. Oh my god! What did I do to myself last night? 
I pondered. Staggering to the bathroom, I began to shake off the effects of my J.D. haze. Descending the stairs, pain enveloped me and my joints protested. Everything throbbed. Peering into the kitchen, I spotted her. Hello, my love. What happened to you last night? Do you want to hear about it? I cursed inwardly. Just had a drink with an old friend, got carried away, that's all. I seated myself, poured some orange juice, downed it, and poured another. Really? Who was it? Someone I know? My mind raced. No, I don't think so. It was Bob. Haven't seen him in ages. He was in town on business. Bob. A flicker of recognition crossed her face when she turned around. Yeah, probably. I mentioned him once. We were in college together, played football. He still asked about you. Claire seemed puzzled. Sorry, don't recall any Bob, but as long as you had fun, right? Seize the moment. She took a seat across from me. Recalling my conversation with Sammy, I looked her in the eye. So, honey, what did you do last night? Anything interesting? When did you get back? She met my gaze, lying effortlessly. Oh, nothing much. Finished work. Grabbed a bite and drinks. Home by 9.30. Started to worry about you, but remembered your late meeting. I knew she hadn't returned home by then because I was still there at 10 p.m. That's when I reached my limit and headed to the bar. Second strike. I've got some things to take care of this morning, so I'll shower and hit the road. I might be late tonight, so don't wait up. Bob mentioned he'd be in touch. We've got catching up to do. If he stays a few days, you'll have to invite him over. It's nice reconnecting with old friends. I'll make sure to do that. You must have some fond memories of him. She gazed at me with a blank expression, trying to conceal any reaction. But there was something there. I could sense it. Maybe it'll come back to me later. Love. Now hurry, or you'll be late. Want me to drive? You had a bit too much to drink last night. No, I'm fine. I'll grab a taxi to pick up my car. Thanks, though. After downing more orange juice and a couple of painkillers, I got dressed and left the house 30 minutes later while Claire was still getting ready. I had a hectic day ahead. One thing was certain. This wouldn't drag on. I gritted my teeth at the thought of Claire with Bob. My fists clenched. He'd pay, and I'd crush him. Work was chaos call after call to resolve line issues. My secretary handled some, but I had to attend meetings. By mid-morning, the rush eased, and I had a bit of downtime to address personal matters. Closing my office door, I delved into my finances. Within 15 minutes, I had cinched up my wallet strings and relocated some cash out of easy reach. Additionally, I scheduled a meeting with a lawyer to explore the option of divorce. With a few days still ahead, I figured it would afford me time to gather further intel. While it might not carry substantial weight, it could provide some leverage. Claire maintained her own bank account and credit card, so no action was necessary there. The issue lay in accessing our joint account. Yet, I swiftly closed that avenue, ensuring she couldn't access more than what remained. My personal account was safeguarded with only a nominal balance, the rest securely withdrawn. Given our childless status, any split would likely be straightforward. I privately resolved that reconciliation rested solely on Claire's confession and plea for forgiveness. Any reluctance would spell the end for us. This realization weighed heavily on me as I sat pensively at my desk, reflecting on the day's events and decisions. Did I require further insight into Bob's character and additional evidence? Or was my knowledge alone sufficient to confront them both? Interrupting my contemplation, the phone rang. Hello? It's me, Sammy. How are you, Steve? Oh, you know, caught up with things, thoughts, plans, sorting through it all. Interestingly, I've made some headway, got more intel on this guy from a friend. His name's Bob Stones, and he's married. I've also got his address and workplace. I obtained this information discreetly. A friend who knows Claire recently spotted her with him. According to her, they're getting quite cozy. She insists that despite their efforts to conceal it, the signs are evident. Has she witnessed them together? I inquired. Yes. They were at the Ramada the other evening after the seminar. They lingered after everyone else had left. As she mentioned, they seemed at ease with each other. Well, it's a starting point. I'm certain there are CCTV cameras there if necessary. Anyway, please provide me with his details. I need to unravel this. It's gnawing at me inside and I'm not sure how much longer I can keep it bottled up. Sammy provided her details and in minutes, I located his social media page and obtained his photo. That's when I felt like I recognized his face. It seemed familiar, but where and when had I encountered this face before? Glancing at my watch nearly lunchtime, I contemplated calling Claire perhaps to arrange a meeting or simply to stir things up. My heart sank as I dialed her number. The knot in my stomach tightened as I heard her answer. Hi, darling, she greeted, recognizing my number. 
Hey, sweetheart, what's your lunch plan? Any chance we can meet up? Oh, I'm sorry, dear. I have an appointment in 30 minutes that will take up the whole day. I was just going to grab something quick at the grocery store nearby. Everything okay? What's up with the meeting? Anything interesting? Just the usual routine with a new client. It's Mr. Stone's, I think. Her words cut through me sharply, as if she was deliberately taunting me with his name. I held my breath for a moment, trying to keep my composure. Nice. Are you around? Her voice came through the earpiece. Yes, I'm here, you damned cow. That's strike three. Both you and Mr. Damn Stones will face consequences soon. No reprieve, no mercy. It's going to be a complete scorched earth. Um, yes, honey, I'm here. Sorry, I got a little lost in thought for a moment there. Anyway, I have to run, and I know you have to get ready for your meeting, too. Have a good time, and I'll catch up with you later, okay? Bye. Love you. Bye. I ended the call, seething with rage, and sat there gritting my teeth when my secretary popped her head in through the door. Steve, I'm heading to the grocery store nearby. Want me to grab you anything? I pondered for a moment. Yeah, surprise me. Just make sure it's substantial, hearty, with plenty of red meat. I'm craving something to really sink my teeth into. She gave me an odd look, then nodded before closing the door. She couldn't shake the feeling that her boss was acting strangely. He'd been holed up in his office all morning, business as usual, but there was an undercurrent. Something was brewing. She just knew it. Sammy dialed her sister's office and stepped into the lobby to find her sister exiting the elevator alongside a tall, dark-haired man. He looked to be around 30, a few years older, perhaps. She recognized him from his photo on the internet, Bob Stones. Standing before her sister, who seemed taken aback, Sammy asked, What are you doing here? Her sister's discomfort was palpable, her plans clearly disrupted. I just thought I'd swing by to see you and maybe grab lunch, Sammy said with an innocent smile. Well, Mr. Stones and I have a business lunch planned, so maybe another time, her sister interjected, extending her hand to him. Bob Stones. Pleasure to meet you, Sammy replied. How long have you known Claire? Bob seemed momentarily puzzled by her question. Claire began to pull Sammy away. Listen, Sammy, we really have to go. We have a meeting. Catch up with you later. Sammy grinned as she observed the couple exiting the premises and stepping into a waiting taxi. She caught her sister's glance as the vehicle drove off. I sat in my office, indulging in a hefty slice of pie laden with red meat, relishing each bite as I contemplated my next moves. With confirmation from Sammy that Claire had left her office, I phoned her secretary to learn she'd be out all day. Well, isn't this just peachy? Financial matters sorted, locksmith ready, lawyer primed. Tonight was meant to be the first step. I planned to toy with this couple before making a move. My old man's advice echoed in my mind. Keep it simple, be direct, obliterate them. Few words, but potent. Maybe something I'd forgotten. But it was coming back. It was imminent. That evening, I was at home when Claire walked in. She looked her usual beautiful self, nothing out of the ordinary. She smelled normal, too, until I went in to kiss her. The unmistakable scent of men's cologne lingered faintly. She noticed my gaze. I didn't say anything, kissed her lightly on the cheek, and headed for the door. Where are you headed? Everything all right? I'm all right. Just got a problem to sort out. Heading over to Jerry's. He asked me to join a poker game with some work buddies. Figured it might help clear my head. Won't be out too late. With that, I shut the door, gritted my teeth, and hopped into my car, easing down the driveway. I drove to Jerry's, parked in front of his house, and he guided me into his garage. Jerry and I go way back. He's always been a bit of a rebel and had run-ins with the law in the past. But with his combat skills, he's just the ally I need for this. You don't mess with a cage fighter. Jerry's a big guy, just over six feet tall and weighing about 198 pounds. All muscle. Trust me, you don't want to cross him. With a personality to match his size, he's a force to be reckoned with. But we've been close pals since school. I gave Jerry a call earlier, and he offered to assist in any way, no questions asked. Exactly the support I need. We quickly slipped into the garage and I changed into dark overalls and a matching ski mask. We stood there like two silent performers, not uttering a word as we climbed into the inconspicuous used car he'd arranged. There was nothing remarkable about it. As we strolled slowly across town to the address Sammy provided, we remained silent. We'd planned it all out in advance, so there was no need for conversation. Jerry parked the car near Bob Stones' house. There was no activity visible except for a single light on. 
We waited quietly. When the front door opened, we observed him exiting, getting into his car and driving off. Jerry trailed him at a safe distance, and since we knew his destination, there was no need to rush or feel anxious. Parking at the training field was hassle-free. We remained in the car while Bob Stones retrieved his customary 50-ball bucket, a routine he apparently followed weekly. It's remarkable what you can learn online with the right search. We settled in, the radio softly playing Kenny Rogers in the background. Jerry glanced at me as the lyrics filled the air, then reached over and muted it. We sat, watching, and waiting. The tension inside me was nearly unbearable. It took immense effort to remain composed and resist the urge to confront him directly. But such a move would be risky. As the parking lot gradually emptied, leaving only a couple of other cars, we both tensed when we saw him approaching his vehicle. Jerry stealthily exited the car and approached our target. Bob Stones was still recovering from his last golf swing practice. As he opened the trunk to stow his clubs, Jerry swiftly seized him and shoved him into the trunk alongside his equipment. A precise punch to the jaw rendered him silent. With Jerry's background in cage fighting, he swiftly gained the upper hand, subjecting Bob Stones to intense pain for the next 30 seconds. Satisfied with the punishment, Jerry shifted his focus to Stones' groin, delivering several blows until he cried out and lost consciousness. Jerry shut the trunk and swiftly returned to the car, where I calmly drove us out of the parking lot without attracting attention. Everything went smoothly, Jerry remarked, removing his gloves and mask. Thanks, Jerry. I owe you big time, I acknowledged gratefully. No worries, buddy. Anytime. I'll always have your back, and there's no way to repay what you've done for me, Jerry replied. That's what friends are for. At least your hands are intact, and there were no security cameras in the parking lot. So, all in all, a job well done. Let's head back and kick off this card game. The others should already be there. We returned and indulged in a friendly game of poker for the next four hours, just for amusement, with no high stakes involved. Being friends, we understood the unspoken rule. Friends don't take advantage of each other. The atmosphere was pleasant. Everyone was aware of the situation and offered their support throughout, which bolstered my confidence about what I knew I would soon have to confront Claire about. But before that, I planned to toy with her. I stumbled through the door a little past 1 a.m., exaggerating how much I had drunk. Jerry arranged for one of the guys to drive my car back. Claire was awake and waiting. It was time for a performance worthy of an Oscar. Darling, why are you still up? I mentioned I might be late. Are you all right? She scrutinized me closely. Jerry and the guys just dropped me off in my car. Concerned that I might have overindulged in J.D. again, I flung my jacket toward the coat rack and missed by a mile. Collapsing onto the sofa, I gazed at her. Claire sat with her arms folded, wearing a disgusted expression. I met her gaze with wide eyes and a blank expression. What? She snorted, clearly itching to say something. Go ahead, spill it. What's wrong, Steve? Is there someone else or something else? You've been acting strangely lately. I chuckled, suppressing the rising anger. All in good time, Claire. Take a chill pill. I'm fine, my dear. It's just been a rough patch lately. It'll all be over soon. Claire studied me, my words echoing in her mind. She seemed uncertain, but there was definitely something brewing. We retired to bed. I pretended to drift off, apparently falling asleep almost instantly. This irritated her, fueling her readiness to confront me. But I remained passive. The following morning, Claire rose early to prepare coffee while I stumbled down the stairs, feigning a hangover. I stumbled into the kitchen. Good morning, darling. How are you? Thank goodness I'm feeling better now. Do you have anything for this headache? She tossed some pain relievers my way as I sipped my coffee. She appeared composed. I noticed her phone on the kitchen table and wondered if someone had called her. Claire caught my gaze on her phone and I sensed her urge to grab it, but doing so would have seemed odd. Pouring myself more orange juice, I casually picked up the phone and saw a flicker of panic in her eyes. So she got the message somehow. I quickly glanced at it before sliding it back to her. Needs charging, sweetheart. Wouldn't want to miss any messages due to a dead battery. I exited the kitchen to get dressed. Claire watched me, sensing that something was amiss, and Bob hadn't texted her this morning, as he had been doing for the past few weeks. But he couldn't know, could he? She dismissed the thought. She hadn't been that careless, and it had only been a brief fling. There were a few lunches, dinners, a couple of outings, and, of course, three hotel stays not that she was counting. It was just safe fun, she rationalized, and Steve would never find out, would he? This thought made her pause. 
When was the last time she and her husband had been carnal? She couldn't recall. Perhaps that's just how it was. She needed to address it promptly. She had become so consumed by Bob that she overlooked what was right in front of her, the one thing that could raise Steve's suspicions. I hurried down the stairs and dashed out the door, evading Claire's attempt at a deeper kiss. Waving and smiling, I drove off around 11 a.m. for work. Feeling playful, I decided to text Claire. Apologies for today, my dear. I've got a lot on my mind, but it'll sort out soon. Love you. X. I reclined in my chair, waiting for a reaction. Shortly after lunch, Sammy rang me up. Steve, what's the deal? What's up, Sammy? Bob Stones was discovered smacked in his car trunk by a golf club worker today. Claire mentioned it. She's pretty shaken. I reassured her these things happen sometimes nowadays, especially when it's someone we know, but we shouldn't dwell on it too much. You weren't involved, were you? Wow, was he seriously injured? I can't say it's a loss, but no, I had no part in it. He's just a bit roughed up. Heard he has some cuts and bruises, but nothing serious. Did you find out how she found out? Yeah. She had a meeting scheduled with him today and his company called to say he was in the hospital. His wife made the call. Seems sweet. Believable, but convenient. Maybe they won't have it so easy next time. What do you mean, Steve? Accidents happen in strange places. That night, Claire wasn't home. Her car was gone, and there was no note. I dialed her phone. Where are you, honey? I asked cheerily. Oh, I'm at the hospital visiting a friend. I'll be home soon. I'm on my way. All right. Hope your friend improves. Anyway, see you soon, love. Love you. Bye. I hung up before she could reply. Thirty minutes later, she returned, looking worn out. How's your friend? I hope it's nothing serious and she gets discharged soon. Claire seemed about to speak, then changed her mind. Oh, yeah, it's not too serious. She just took a fall and got some nasty bruises. We'll be back home in a few days. This coffee is good. Yes, thank you, Claire replied, taking a sip. The other night, one of my company's representatives was attacked, she mentioned, leaving the statement hanging for a reaction. Oh, God. Really? What happened? Was he smacked and left in his car overnight? Yes, unfortunately. Bob wasn't severely injured. It seems like they just wanted to thrash him up for no reason. Nothing was stolen. Strike four. This is the same Bob you claim not to know. Cow, I muttered to myself. Claire noticed my gaze and realized her mistake. She quickly tried to cover it up, but it was too late. Now she knew I knew. Hurriedly, she made her way to the exit to change clothes. I suspected she might receive a phone call any second. But from whom? I realized I needed to reassess my plan as things were progressing rapidly. Calling out to Claire as she ascended the stairs, I informed her that I needed to step out for a while to handle something, assuring her not to worry and that I wouldn't be gone long. I drove to Bob Stone's home address and knocked on the door. It opened to reveal a petite, dark-haired woman standing before me. Mrs. Stones, you don't know me, but I need to discuss something delicate with you. Can I step inside for a moment? She regarded me with a mix of nerves, curiosity, and caution. I'm Steve Ryland. My wife, Claire Ryland, is having an affair with your husband. I paused as a blend of realization and horror flickered across her face. Stepping back, she motioned for me to enter, leading me to the living room. I assume this concerns both of them, she said, pain evident in her eyes. Yes, unfortunately. They've been having an affair and I only discovered it a few days ago. I'm sorry to have to bring this to your attention. I also know that he's currently in the hospital. Her demeanor seemed to collapse inward, tears streaming down her face for several moments. I suspected as much. I knew he was at it again, she spat. I'm filing for divorce from Claire. She's had ample chances to come clean and I can't tolerate her deceit any longer. I'm not certain how long this has been going on, but the fact that she betrayed me is enough. I can't forgive or forget. Does this relate to the thrashing he endured last night? I met her imploring gaze and swiftly made my decision. I can't say. I had no hand in it whatsoever. The whole thing caught me off guard, leaving me just as stunned. Whoever did it, I can't say I'm upset about it. Sorry, but that's how I feel. Could he also be involved with someone else's wife? Nothing would surprise me. Well, he can stay far away from my doorstep. I've had my fill of this. That's why we're back here, because he cheated. I left her still seething after providing her with the contact information for my locksmith and lawyer. Dear, oh my God, what a mess. I hopped into my car and made my way to the hospital, which was just ten minutes away. I arrived even quicker, 
Passing through the lobby, I felt a weight lifting from my shoulders, almost allowing a smile to break through. Squeezing into the elevator, I ascended to the fourth floor where a certain Mr. Bob Stones resided. Consulting the patient directory, I located his room in a side wing. Slipping past the nurse's station without notice, I entered his room and quietly closed the door behind me. Upon entering, he gave me a puzzled look. Approaching his bed, I examined his bandaged face. One eye was shut, the other bloodshot. He strained to focus. Jerry did a commendable job, I mused, scrutinizing him. You seem to be having trouble recognizing me. Bob, take a moment to think. I'll wait, I said, grinning as he cast me a bewildered glance. I settled on the edge of his bed. Peering through his facial bandages, I noticed a severely bruised eye and suspected issues with his jaw. It's inconsequential. Surveying the elevated bedding supporting his lower body, I winced. This looks awful. You must be in pain, right? Swiftly snatching the emergency button from him and tossing it beneath the bed, I playfully jabbed his ribs, prompting a squeal. Still pondering my identity, Bob? Need a hint? His face retained its mix of confusion and curiosity. Let's see. Reflect on the married women you've been involved with and the marriages you've disrupted. Does that jog your memory? His eyes met mine, revealing a mind working overtime to piece things together. Another moment elapsed as I savored his evident distress and uncertainty. Need a nudge, Bob? Think about it. I'm tied to a woman named Claire. Does that jog your memory? Recognition sparked in his eyes. Got it now? I grinned, fierce as a pre-dinner tiger. He nodded in understanding. Great. Glad we've cleared that up. So, wondering about my presence here? Let's get to it. I'm here bearing a message from your wife. Pausing for comprehension, I mimicked the throat clearing, noting his impaired speech. She wants you to hear this. Here's the gist. Stay away. Don't show up. Divorce papers are coming your way. And just so you know, you're truly contemptible. A tear welled in his visible eye. Chuckling, I observed his restricted movement and leaned in to meet his gaze. I'm ending my marriage because my wife found pleasure with someone like you. This is just your starting point. We'll encounter each other again, guaranteed. I'll disrupt your life as you've disrupted mine. I won't relent. So be prepared to run. By the way, I'm not responsible for this to you. Just a heads up. I wanted to keep him guessing. Raising my fist, I struck his exposed eye. I heard a crunch. Not a big deal. Then a sudden hit to my groin. He yelled and then blacked out. I stood up and exited the room. Was I content? Far from it. But it was a beginning. He'd lie there, realizing his error, unable to act. My departure was unnoticed. Had anyone seen, they'd have noticed my wide smile. I drove home cautiously, gearing up to address my other issue. My anger was contained. Once retaliation started, it was a path I'd eagerly pursue. While the end of my marriage deeply saddened me, her betrayal left no chance of reconciliation. My only solace? Those who wronged me would soon experience even greater pain. I don't easily forgive. Bob Stone's card hinted at a future encounter. Pulling into the driveway, I noticed Claire's car exactly where she'd parked it just two hours prior. Absent-mindedly, I tapped its hood as I headed to my front door, contemplating this might be my final entry as a married man. A leaden feeling consumed my heart upon entering. The accumulated anxieties of recent days felt tangible, pressing down as I made my way to the living room. Approaching the door, I caught the faint sound of the TV. I paused, fixing my gaze on her. Claire was seated on the sofa, exuding palpable fear and apprehension, as though expecting imminent repercussions. She seemed to sense the culmination of our charade, though no words had been spoken. Her hands quivered as she tried to maintain composure, while I stood observing. Lifting her eyes, fear was unmistakably present. Her lips moved, attempting to speak, but no words emerged. I entered passed by her to pour myself a JD over ice and set the glass on the table between us before sitting. Meeting her gaze, I detected her fear, coupled with a hint of defiance. Silently, I reached for my drink and savored a slow sip, feeling its warmth as it went down, my eyes locked onto hers without wavering. She waited. Let her wait, I mused, taking another deliberate sip, maintaining my silence. My face remained impassive as I observed the woman I once deeply loved staring back at me, Though my heart still harbored strong emotions for her, they were now tempered by the pain she'd inflicted without cause. It was time for her to understand my anguish. While I gazed at her, she found no hint of optimism in my expression. We had said so much already. Wordlessly, Claire seemed to gather herself, standing taller as if choosing bravery. 
Unaware of my knowledge and unable to bear the weight of my silent accusation, she broke the silence. Where did you go? Her eyes revealed her anxiety while I remained motionless and quiet. Speak to me, she pleaded. I leisurely took another sip of my JD. Nothing like JD after a hectic day, I mused, noting her growing distress. What's bothering you, Steve? She snapped, frustrated by my silent response. Fine, Claire. I'll share my whereabouts if you disclose yours. Deal? Her eyes met mine, cautious and wary, each of us sizing the other up like wary boxers, uncertain of who'd strike first and wary of the counterpunch. I mentioned being at the hospital visiting a friend. What's your point? She reclined in her chair, arms folded, satisfied with her initial response. I leisurely took another sip of my JD. Darling, I anticipated that response. Care to reconsider? Her composed facade wavered, fear evident in her eyes. She was becoming anxious. I had indeed been with my friend, just as I'd stated. Claire, what's causing the confusion? I'll clarify. I was visiting a friend, I began. Though our relationship is recent, we're growing closer. I scrutinized her reaction closely. Despite her efforts to remain poised, the defiant tilt of her chin betrayed her. Did I discuss her husband, Bob Stones? Does that name ring a bell? I hinted. A change in her demeanor was clear. It seemed her husband had an accident and was hospitalized. Though not severe, he had suffered significant bruises. He's recovering well, which is a relief, isn't it? I teased, watching Claire's face redden, sensing her apprehension. So, what was your conversation with Mrs. Stones about? She inquired, both eager and fearful to know. From what I gathered, her husband appears to be a consistent womanizer or cheater. Upon discovering his infidelity, I believe she deserved to be informed. Oh my God, she exclaimed, feeling a constriction in her throat akin to a noose tightening. Are you all right? Can I get you a drink? Do you know about Bob Stones' indiscretions? I took a sip of my drink as she struggled to respond, her words failing her. Let me assist you, I said, looking deeply into her eyes, hoping she'd sense my sincerity. I'm aware now. Her eyes widened and she covered her mouth in shock. Observing her face, I saw a mix of disbelief and surprise. Despite seeking some support, my expression remained impassive. I'm aware of your involvement with Bobby, darling. I've known for some time. Not an eternity, but enough. So, if you have something to confess, now's the time. Before you leave. Downing my drink, I rose to refill it. You sure you don't want one? I asked, maintaining composure under the circumstances. She nodded and I poured us both generous drinks, returning to sit across from her. Claire took a long sip before speaking. It was meaningless, just physical. It meant nothing. Really? It meant absolutely nothing? Remember our vows? Her mention of the common, it was just lovemaking excuse, ignited anger within me. It was a fleeting moment, Steve. It just happened. Seriously? Just happened? Such things don't just occur spontaneously. It requires two consenting adults, planning and agreement. Don't belittle me. You and Bobby have been deceiving me for weeks, maybe even months, but it ends now. Both of you can go to hell. It only happened twice, and honestly, it wasn't that enjoyable. The idea was enticing but the act itself was overshadowed by my constant fear of you discovering it. Well, I've finally uncovered your deceit. I hope jeopardizing our marriage was worth it. Steve, I am genuinely sorry. It was meaningless, and we can work through this. I'll make things right and follow whatever you decide. A sudden, almost manic laugh escaped my lips, causing her to look at me with a realization that this situation was grave. It was an error, but we can mend it. I regret it deeply. Sure, you regret being caught. Would you have stopped if you hadn't been discovered? I doubt it. All the usual excuses pour out so effortlessly from someone unfaithful. Your lies, ever since this began, are just as fluent. You may believe them, but I certainly won't. Honestly, the woman I once loved and married seems lost. I don't even recognize you anymore. My words seemed to cut through her pretense, and she realized the gravity of our situation. What should I do, Steve? I'll do anything. Is it over between us? While I was away, I reached out to Sammy. She's aware of everything, too. She'll be here shortly to pick you up. But where will I go? Are you throwing me out? Her shock became evident as she processed the situation. You're free to go wherever, you deceitful person. Maybe back to the hospital to see your other man. I don't give a damn. What matters is that you leave. We're finished. I took the last sip of my drink and set the glass down with a firm thud, signaling the conversation's end. Claire stared at me, shocked when a knock interrupted us. Rising, I greeted Sammy at the door. 
How did everything go? She asked as we returned to the living room, observing her sister who was now crying uncontrollably, her shoulders heaving. Just get her out of here, Sammy. I hate to be so direct, but if she stays, I'm concerned about what I might do. Despite her betrayal, I still have feelings for her. Please, make it quick. Thanks for handling this, Sammy, and I'll touch base soon. I poured myself another drink as Sammy efficiently packed Claire's belongings. Over the next few days, I heard my wife's cries while watching her sister pack and stuff her things into a few suitcases. Removing her from my home took less than ten minutes. The true challenge lay ahead. Removing her from my life entirely, and healing, retribution would aid in this journey. That's what I awaited now along with another stiff drink. I gazed at the flames of the bonfire I'd lit in the backyard, consuming all of Claire's belongings. She had no place in my home anymore. Damn you, I muttered, finishing the bottle and tossing it into the fire. 